Thank you so much for having me out tonight. Um, I have with me Matthew Saney, who is our first ever chief data officer with the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Um, and Matthew is, is standing with me right now because he's gonna do some of the technical things that I'm not very fluent in talking about, um, about some of the things that we're doing with open data. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it is that our office does and why it's really important for us to be with you all tonight talking about data and transparency, particularly in government and more importantly in prosecutors' offices when we're talking about our criminal justice system. Uh, before I begin, um, Simona Rollinson introduced herself that she works at the county doing technology, but she's the Chief Technology Officer for Cook County, and I've had the pleasure of working with Simona for a number of years. And she, she says I was her boss, but I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. So Simona made me look good because she was very fluent um, in these things and brought really a, an approach to data and the use of data at Cook County that had not been there before. I also want to thank David Namcom from Clarity Partners, who I saw earlier, and there he is, David, um, who, yeah, you can clap for David. Oh, you're a Clarity person. Um, <laughs> Non-Clarity non people can clap for David, too. Um, <laughs> David and his team um, worked on, designed um, our website uh, for the state's attorney's office, which. I said to many people who, if you'd never seen our website before, it was very much stuck back in about 2003. Um, in fact, it had a what's new tab on it that was not updated since 2012. Um, so again, quick, easy fixes uh, that make it look like we're caught up with technology, but David and his team were instrumental in that. Just very quickly, um, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office is the second largest prosecutor's office in the country. We're second only to LA County. We have about 1,100 employees that work for our office. About 800 of them are attorneys. Uh, we deal with everything related to crime, um, felonies and misdemeanors, so everything from simple possession of marijuana all the way up to first degree murder. Um, I also want to take a moment um, at this time to acknowledge the loss of life of one of our Chicago police officers this afternoon, um, not far from here at all, Commander Bauer of the 18th District. Um, as I talk about the work that we do in the prosecutor's office, it cannot be done without our partners in law enforcement who every day put their lives on the line um, for our protection here in the city of Chicago. Um, and, and we must acknowledge um, that sacrifice. And so. Um, to Sergeant or Commander Bauer and his family, our hearts are grieving for them. Um, Chicago represents half of Cook County, um, so about 2.7 million people. Cook County is about 5.3 million people. So we are responsible um, for the prosecution of cases of the entire county. Chicago gets a lot of attention um, because it is a major metropolitan area. Um, the Chicago Police Department is our log largest a partner, law enforcement partner with about 12,000 officers, but we also have about 100 other municipalities um, that work with our office as we um, prosecute cases. And so last year, and Matthew can give some context to it, um, we saw cases that were initiated somewhere around 40,000 cases, felony cases, um, that were coming into our office. Misdemeanor cases, cases um, that don't have a penalty of anything over a year in prison. Um, so something that as simple as you can get a supervision, a, you know, don't get in trouble, come back in a few months. Um, we saw a couple hundred thousand misdemeanor cases. Um, so the volume of work that we do um, is rather extensive with the staff that we have. Um, a couple other facts that we may not know about Cook County, in addition to being the second largest prosecutor's office in the country, we are the largest a uh, single site jail in the country at 26 in California. We are also the world's largest unified court system here in Cook County. Um, and so what that means is there is a tremendous amount of information and data um, that is captured in individual silos, um, whether it's at the jail, whether it's in our office, the clerk's office, the public defender's office. Um, and again, a, a huge volume of people that we deal with. Um, so that being said, why does this matter, the, trans, the transparency piece? 
I, the criminal justice system is one of those areas in our lives that we want to not have any contact with um, at all. Because one, it would mean that either we have been the victim of crime or some, something has afflicted our families um, in a way in which we have to be introduced to this. Or we know someone who has been uh, involved in the criminal justice system and the impact that it has on their families. But we pay a tremendous amount of money, our, our tax dollar resources, to the maintenance of our criminal justice system. And as we talk about safety of our communities, what we want to make sure is that the things that we're doing are actually having an impact on public safety. Public safety is one of those things that you really can't quantify. It's a feeling. Do you feel like your neighborhood is safe? If you watch something on the news, if you were inclined to believe what you saw on television about the city of Chicago, I would be surprised to see a room this big um, because most people would be afraid to come out. That's, a real, that's not a real representation of what's happening in Chicago or Cook County. But when we have conversations about public safety, when we have conversations about public policy, about the things that we want to do to make ourselves safer, um, whether it's laws, enhancements to laws, whether it's justice reform, maybe it's repealing laws that have been on the books, we often do it in this space without the benefit of data. Criminal justice has long been one of those areas of public policy that has been guided by headlines and gut reaction and not data. You see something on the news, it will scare you. You will tell your alderman, you will tell your state legislator, I don't like this to scare me, do something to make this better. And then there will be legislation and there will be a push and then we will have laws on the books and then it won't be until years later that we have the opportunity to really see what the impact is on the changes that we've made. One of the biggest examples that I use to talk about that is for example, the war on drugs of the 80s and 90s. And back in the 80s and 90s, when crack cocaine was at its introduction and at its height, there was this real fear that the introduction of this drug was going to tear apart communities, that the violence that was associated with the drug trade required that our response to that um, be exceptionally high. And so what happened was that there was criminal justice policy that was implemented um, where we saw penalties for those who were using crack cocaine um, and mandatory minimums around that be extremely high. At the same time, we saw disparities of what was happening with those who were using powder cocaine. But again, at the time, because of the conversation around crack cocaine, it was thought that the people who used that would somehow be more dangerous. What we saw years later when we talk about incarceration rates and mass incarceration and we look at devastation across communities and we trace back what has happened to those neighborhoods in those areas, looking at data, we're able to see that our approach to what we've called, dubbed the war on drugs, really caused more harm in some areas than any good that we sought to accomplish. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves in the criminal justice space because the price is really high, is how are we coming at these decisions? How are those decisions informed? And how do we know that we're actually having a meaningful impact on it? Now I will tell you, the criminal justice system is not one that believes in the mantra that everything should be open. In fact, I think we are the exact opposite. Prosecutor's offices especially are not ones to share how we do the work that we do. Um, and we have a tremendous amount of power. It is the prosecutor who decides when to charge, when not to charge. It is the prosecutor decides what to charge or what not to charge. It is the prosecutor who makes recommendations for plea bargains, recommendations for sentencing. And it's all done in this black hole of information. We have this tool called prosecutorial discretion, which is our ability to make these decisions. And those decisions are done really outside of the view of the public. And so what you see, or what the public sees, perhaps is a headline about a sentence that was given down, or perhaps a headline about arrest rates going up, but not any real insight into how we make those decisions. Or 
when we're having conversations about disparities in our criminal justice system, for again, if we use the example of the war on drugs and the penalties for those who were caught with crack cocaine versus those with powder cocaine and the racial implications of that, again, we don't have any, any insight into how those decisions were being made by prosecutors on the ground. So it was very important to me when I took this job. I mean, I took this job in 2016 at a time when our criminal justice system here in Cook County was under the microscope both, both locally and nationally around fairness and equity to say, how do I ensure the people who live here that the things that we are doing are not rooted in gut feelings, are not rooted in what I think will make you feel better, but actually are designed to make us safer if we don't have a way to measure it. Um, I am a firm believer that you cannot fix what you cannot measure, but the way that our justice system and our internal infrastructures were set up was not for measurement. So for all of that information that we come across every day, for those thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases that we see every year, we weren't able to measure anything. We weren't able to see whether there were trends. When we're looking and we're talking, for example, about what's happening in the city around carjackings right now, in 2017, the numbers were off the chart, but how does that trend with 2016 and 15? And if we're able to pull out what was happening in 2017, how do we change our approach in 2018? Our systems weren't set up to do that. So it was very important to me um, that we hired someone uh, who was responsible for making that data available. And it has two purposes. Again, for the public, I believe you have the right, and I, as your public servant, have an obligation to share with you everything that I'm doing. Uh, you elected me to do this job and to do it in a way that you can hold me accountable. You cannot hold me accountable if you have nothing on which to measure me against. Not gut feelings, not what you heard, not what somebody said, I heard she doesn't do this. I need to show you that what are the measurable differences that have happened in our justice system from the time that I took office to the time of the next election. And so we created the first ever chief data officer for our office, for the public accountability piece. And then for the internal accountability piece. I had worked in the Cook County uh, President's Office where we were very much wedded to the belief of performance management. And we, we held performance management in high regard that every Thursday, I and my executive team would sit with our bureau chiefs and department heads to measure, the people are nodding, yes, they hated that, to measure what it was that we were doing with the taxpayer dollar. Were we more efficient and better at our jobs um, year over year, month over month? And so I took that from my work at the county and brought it into the state's attorney's office and said, how do we measure with our attorneys whether we have long case processing times? Whether people are sitting in jail awaiting trial for low-level offenses for two months when it should be two weeks? How do we measure why it takes us so long on some of these homicide cases where we know when there is a swift disposition of cases, when there's a swift answer, it, it, there tends to be better outcomes later. But we had cases that were lingering seven, eight, nine. In fact, on my first two months here, we had a DUI case that was 10 years old. And how do you hold account someone that has a case lingering for 10 years that maybe has touched four or five or six attorneys? And what does it say to that victim? This was a DUI that resulted in a loss of life who've been waiting for justice for their family members for 10 years, and we had no explanation as to why that happened. So from an external accountability piece and an internal accountability piece, we wanted to make sure that we were driving performance um, to make sure that we were best serving the people of Cook County. And so we created a position that did not exist. And I will tell you, in an office that is full of lawyers and full of prosecutors, um, who we know how to do our jobs and we don't need eggheads coming in telling us with these zeros and ones what this looks like. Um, we had to sell it hard. 
we had to sell that we cannot operate in the same manner that we've operated in the criminal justice system for years, that having a chief data officer was a necessity just as vital as it is for me to have a chief of staff. And so in the midst of budget cuts and all that was happening, we were able to hire Matthew, um, who came on board with us um, just a couple of months ago uh, to start the process of looking at our infrastructure. He will tell you, and Simona will tell you, that the way that our infrastructure, our data infrastructure is set up right now, our case management system is crap. Um, it is not very good. It was not set up for us to publicly share data. Um, the way that we input data is difficult. I have lawyers um, who are, are, are public servants. They don't make very much money, and they have some of the highest caseloads of attorneys in the country doing this work, who we are also tasking with data entry. So some of our data is not very reliable. And still, we know that this is the conditions under which we're working. We still have that obligation to try to make the systems and our attorneys comfortable with entering that information and using that information, again, both publicly and internally. One of the big things that we did around this is that we introduced last year um, our first ever data report uh, for 2016 that, or 2000, yeah, 2016 that looked at what happened over the one year case initiations, please. We broke it down by race. Every case or every uh, section of crimes that we looked at, how many people of color were charged and what were the outcomes. We did that over about 10 different uh, ranges, everything from gun cases to DUI to retail theft to homicide. And this year, uh, we just released, Matthew, grab it, make us look like we planned this. We should say one, two, three data. Um, <laughs> we just released today, um, we wanted to get it off the presses for you all tonight and there are extra copies here, the 2017 data report. <laughs> so the 2017 data report is the first full year that I have been in office. So we now are able to benchmark where we were in 2016 before I got here. 2017 is how the cases of my first full year. And it is our commitment to release the data report every year. This is the expectation that you should have of our office. Um, and more importantly, and what Matthew will talk about, is that in a couple of weeks, we will be um, launching, in co collaboration with uh, the county technology department, um, our open data portal um, that you all will be able to see case level data from the state's attorney's office going back a number of years, where you will have the opportunity to look at the information um, that you deem important um, to be able to collect and put together data sets this is when it starts getting tricky for me, <laughs> data sets, um, and to tinker with the data as you seem f deem fit. I will tell you that it is revolutionary um, in the way that access to data, prosecutor data, is done across the country. I believe we will be the only prosecutor's office in the United States, states that allows our data to be on an open portal. And so my last point before I let Matthew talk about some of that and do, I think, a brief demonstration of what, may, what will be available, we are also announcing that we're putting together a data advisory group. Um, and certainly for those of you who are in this room who are interested um, in that work that we're trying to do, um, we want what this looks like to be informed by those who are on the ground doing this work, who have you know, not had the either the benefit or the discouragement of working in government um, to know what's possible or not possible to help drive how we put this work together. And so we will be um, tapping you all um, to lend your expertise to help us in this, in this work and we'll start putting that together starting um, in the coming days. Um, but with that, I wanna turn it over to Matthew. Um, thank you so much. Um, to kind of uh, put a little bit of perspective on this, um, this actually is the anniversary of my third month being a part of uh, King's <laughs> Team. And so, um, 
when I came in and sat down with her on day one, I, w I was really nervous, as one is on their first day of a new job. And the first thing she said to me is, I want to have the most transparent and open prosecutor's office um, um, in the country. Um, the lucky part for me on that end is that's a really low bar to clear. <laughs> uh, but um, the exciting part is that um, we plan to crush it. And we are really, really excited to drive toward this as much as possible. Um, and so um, it's been um, kind of drinking out of a fire hose for the last three months as I'm understanding just um, uh, what our data systems are, um, how much information's in there, what we can trust, what the actual systems process is within the prosecutor's office as how um, cases flow through their system. And by the way, we don't just do felonies, and we're starting with felonies, but we do civil cases, um, we do asset forfeiture um, work, we obviously do misdemeanor work, so there's lots of variation and, and nuance to all of this, um, which uh, has kept me up at night, at the, uh, to say the very least. Um, but um, what we are doing and, and, and shooting to do is um, uh, take about 450 um, separate tables um, and uh, flatten them out into four files that um, include basically 300,000 um, case IDs, um, 300,000 participants to those case IDs, and about 650,000 charges um, that we have issued. And it will go back to about 2010. It'll include um, kind of the starting of the funnel, if you will, um, for those of you guys in marketing. Um, and uh, that is um, our intake process. When cases are brought to us, we don't get to pick which cases are brought to us. We just receive the cases from the different um, uh, law enforcement agencies. Then it goes to our initiation process. So we review the case, make a determination on whether or not we think there's an actual case there that we should charge. Then we have to decide which actual charge we apply to that case, which could be one of many cases, because when people commit something wrong, they often do multiple things wrong at the same time. Then we actually have to figure out how to, to dispose of that case, if you will, try it, get a guilty plea, um, uh, you know, come up with some type of alternate um, uh, prosecution system for the person, and then finally, um, the actual sentence. So this is a lot of information that moves across all these different tables that we're trying to condense and organize and make it digestible, um, not just by data scientists, but by also you know, just um, regular folks to have some type of understanding what the criminal justice system is in Cook County. So here I'm gonna pull up some examples of this. Uh, And this is our wonderful Cook County Open Data Portal. Gmail. Yeah, can you hold that? Thank All right, so here are the four different tables that I'll show you guys a preview and some visualizations that help explain a little bit of context and nuance of how complicated these data sets are. Um, so first is our intake table. Let's see, and here's an example of, of this. This table itself is about 300,000 rows with 16 columns. Um, Here's a quick look at what uh, the columns are. A few sets of IDs. A case itself is an interesting idea that um, gets redefined over time in many different ways. So often the way that a case was started um, historically is it's a vanilla envelope that someone holds in their hand and has a number written on it and carries it around like 26th Street or one of the other courthouses. But that case could have multiple people associated with it. They could have multiple charges. One person could have three charges associated with it. One person could have one charge associated with it. And there could be a, you know, a two people on a case. So this starts to get really complicated as we start to map it out. But we've got a case ID that represents essentially one incident of criminal behavior at the felony level. Then we have participant IDs, right? And those participant IDs represent each individual that was involved with that case. So you can see that there will be multiple cases that have multiple participants on it that have, um, uh, uh, that have entered into the system. 
you've got information about when we receive the data, the status of the individual, the age of um, the individual, the gender, the race, when the incident took place, the agency, the unit, the city, the arrest date, and then when we reviewed it and what our um, uh, results were. And this is a pretty clean, easy to, to digest in, um, structure, really well standardized. If you load it up into your SQL server, it'll load very nicely. Um, and you can start doing things like this. So here is a pie chart um, that looks out of uh, that... So this is looking at 2016. And this is looking at the number of cases that were reviewed where the person was identified as being white. By the way, that identification does not come from us, but it comes from the law um, enforcement agency that uh, arrested that person. Um, and then um, the light blue color here represents how often we approved a white person, um, uh, a, a, a case uh, associated with a white person. It ends up being about 91%. You can then go in here and you can switch the filters out, remove it, now it's just identified as black. You'll notice that the raw number of cases went through the roof. It went from about 3,000 um, approved cases to about 12,000 approved cases. But you'll also see that it happens to be that this data um, uh, uh, shows that the approval rate in 2016 was roughly the same, about 90%. Now there's a lot of nuance into this, right? There's a whole series of different types of offenses that could exist. And so different offenses, like murder cases, have a much lower approval rating than um, uh, uh, narcotics cases, which actually, we don't actually do approval, they go straight to, um, uh, uh, they go straight to charges, actually. Yeah, there's no approval process on narcotics. And so um, different, you know, there are different things that you want to control for if you're trying to understand um, racial implications of how we review cases or how cases have been reviewed historically um, within this data set. But this data set allows you to do that and um, control for those different factors. And that's a really important um, uh, uh, feature that we wanted to make available to the public. So let's go. All right, so now let's talk about initiation. So initiation is actually when we create a charge, which actually ends up having a couple other unique IDs. So this is, again, now we talked about a case being an intersection of an individual to an incident, but it could actually be an individual to an incident to a charge. Um, specifically, I'm in the sense that, um, you know, one person could have been pulled over for a possession of a stolen vehicle but also have been found with narcotics at that time. And you know, the, there's an existential question, is that one case or two cases? And it depends on what type of analysis you're trying to do. And a person can be found guilty on one charge and not another charge, or another charge and not the first charge. And so this also starts to become very tricky when you start to think about what are the trends and patterns that are happening. But we want to provide, we want to provide the public with as much information to do this analysis as correctly as possible. And so in this um, table we have, what is it? Uh, 733,000 um, rows um, and 24 columns. And so you actually have a charge, charge version ID, you get um, an offense title, you get the actual um, offense broken down by chapter, class, section. Um, you have an event um, when the charge came through um, and the event type. Some charges aren't started um, in, uh, with a, like a, an arresting agency, some charges are actually started in, in grand jury or in other places. So there's these other weird nuances that exist in this space. Then um, you get, uh, ge again, gender, race, when the incident began, um, so on and so forth. And again, here's an example of this data. One thing you'll notice is that this data has a primary charge column. This is the concept that when we think about cases, usually the top level charge ends up being what we consider the primary charge. And so, you know, if someone were, uh, had a possession of a stolen weapon, and also charged with, or um, also charged with murder. Usually, murder is considered the more severe charge, and so in that case, that would be get the primary charge, and the possession of stolen weapon would be a, a lesser charge, but it would be included with the case. So, here is an interesting chart looking at um, 2017, and I'm not showing CPD, but I am showing the number of uh, charges that were filed coming out of each law enforcement um, agency in the year 2017. And so again, it's just one sliver, um, but um, when you can take and play with this data correctly, you can start to do some really interesting analysis 
Um, and just to kind of give you guys a sense of like how primary charge affects things, I apply the primary charge filter to it and just look at true. Not only do my numbers drop, but um, the Cook County Sheriff's Office and Cicero PD are much, uh, much larger proportional to the rest of the um, jurisdictions. Again, not, I don't know what that means. I can suggest, I can make a couple assumptions and I'd like to look at offenses and all of these other things and control for many other factors, but there are definitely interesting trends that exist amongst this data. So once we charge someone, we have to then close the case, ideally. And so um, uh, cases get closed in many different ways. Um, with guilty and, and innocence verdicts, um, with things being thrown out, but um, we often refer to this as the disposition. And so again, our disposition data exists on every single charge. Um, this case is about 655,000, 29 columns. We have a lot of the same IDs that you're uh, familiar seeing. Um, and then you've got the actual disposition. And then there is a field called uh, charge disposition reason, where essentially that allows um, um, folks to kind of add a layer of color to it, not just guilty or innocent or um, a verdict of guilt, but um, the truth is the coverage on this field, not so great. So we're looking at about 20% of the data, I think, if I recall correctly, being covered. But we also are providing information about where, what, what court this took place, who is the presiding judge, um, and again, all the same indicators around age, facility, race, offense type. And just to kind of give you guys a sense of the workload, um, this is the 2016 felony um, dispositions um, uh, by month um, that the state's attorney's office uh, uh, essentially cleared these cases one way or another. We do about 2,700 cases a month in 2016. That's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and on the final uh, piece of it, it's sentencing. And so um, sentencing it in its own right uh, is interesting. Um, one thing we noticed that Kim didn't actually uh, reference is um, you know, data entry is a time lag, right? Anyone who's ever worked with data been hand collected by individuals doesn't actually get it instantaneously. Um, and so um, uh, we released the 2016 report in October and then we re-ran the numbers recently in the 2016 report, and we noticed that some of our staff got better at data entry for 2016. So, um, like, this is like, an, it's an important finding, right? It's actually like good that people are getting better with it. Um, and, uh, um, and at the same time, we know that there are, are holes and gaps in this internal data that we have. And so, when we look at sentencing, we have about 200,000 rows of sentencing. Not everyone who gets disposed obviously gets sentenced, right? Um, so um, that, that accounts for a little bit of the fall off, but also the recording of the data around sentencing, um, because it wasn't integral um, to the production of the case, wasn't always done um, at 100% coverage rate. And so as a result, um, uh, you know, we have usually what gets associated to one charge, the sentence, even though the person could have been found guilty on multiple charges and, and, and such. So there are gaps in the sentencing data. But there are things um, here that allow us to um, essentially do some interesting analysis around case length. And so the way that we think about um, uh, cases is uh, it starts with the arraignment for us and ends with the sentencing, uh, if there is a sentencing. And in this case, for those that were sentenced, we're seeing on average about 300 days um, uh, uh, a case. Remember, these are felony level charges. Um, and if we were to look at some of the more involved and complex type um, cases, the numbers go up. So um, that is a quick run through of our data set. We're gonna work with a group of folks kind of um, on all under the, um, of the spectrum around um, kind of kicking the tires on samples of this data so we get a sense for what's missing, um, what might be inserting, um, uh, what might be confusing, how do we best explain it, um, before we just put it out there and, and let everyone run, um, run wild with it, if you will. Um, but I'm excited and curious to hear questions from you all. So thanks again, this is amazing. Um, can't wait to see the data portal when it's live. Um, I, I'm like really excited to ask this question because you rarely get to ask it. Um, so a couple years ago, we, uh, Chad Hacknick put together a uh, open data pledge for all candidates for the county state's attorney. And you signed it, thank you. I wanted to ask the question that like you oftentimes don't get to ask, which is, did we influence you in, in pursuing this? Because here you are, you're releasing all this open data. 
how, if we did it all, like, were we going to do it anyways before, or did it help make the case? I'm kind of just curious about how, if, if at all, our efforts made any impact. Yeah, it actually helped make the case. Um, it, because again, there was not, there's not a model that we were able to follow. There was not, we would say, let's go do what they're doing in New York. They weren't doing this. And so because there was an appetite, because there was a pledge, because we knew that there was an appetite for the data, um, it was, we have to be committed to this. It was a pledge. Um, and I try when, you, to, when I make a promise to, to keep it. Um, but it also meant that we had to make the investment in, in putting together um, a budget that would allow for us to have someone like Matthew. Um, some of the other things that we're doing too was working with the foundation community um, to get grant funding to help build supports to do this. Um, so the MacArthur Foundation has been a good partner with us. Um, we just got a rather significant grant um, to help us with some of this data outreach. And again, uh, not only to the point that you helped us make the case, we are now going to be able to become the model for other offices across the country because the argument was this could not be done. I mean, there's a lot of sensitive information that's contained in the data that we had to de-identify victims, witnesses. I mean, these are very, you know, you see sex crimes up there. There's a lot of information that we have to take out. It doesn't mean that it's not possible. Um, and I think the asking of the question of will you do this and me saying yes meant that I had to make it possible and it will make it possible for other prosecutor's offices too. Hi, do you think it would be possible to like connect this data with individuals' financial data before, during, and after the judicial process and then maybe compare that combined data, uh, contextualize it with per capita earning of different neighborhoods and then maybe compare the neighborhoods to hopefully leverage for passing like public education policy and looking at the systemic preventative aspects that such data hopefully drives towards? Yeah, that's a great question. So I can tell you right now we're just building this part up. What's been important to me, and I didn't talk about it tonight because it's not our data, is when we're looking at trends, particularly as it relates to violent crime, doing basically a heat map of where violence is occurring. And again, these are really complicated conversations um, that sometimes get lost in like headlines, like you hear Southwest Side, bad things happen. And so it's like, ooh, that's the story. The story actually is, is that if we did a heat map and saw where some of our most violent prone neighborhoods were, if you looked at the unemployment rate, for example, you would see that we have the highest levels of unemployment in some of the areas where we have the highest levels of violence. That also correlates with them having the highest, um, I'm sorry, the schools with the lowest funding, so educational attainment. If we looked at educational attainment and employment factors, if we looked at you know where um, resources, economic investment in neighborhoods were, if you did those heat maps, if you did, for example, people who were returning from the criminal justice system um, who have perhaps felony convictions on their record, their inability to work, and what zip codes that they go back to um, coming out of the prison system and correlate that to where we see violence. Um, a lot of this work has been done. So I, I heard there were some U of C folks here. UIC was doing this work. So that work has been done on the front end of where are the hot spots for violence. Um, and I think people often think that hot spots for violence are not related to these other things. You know, people tell me all the time, you keep talking about these social things. These are people making bad choices and that's what it should be about. But if you looked at the data, which is why it was really important to me, that it isn't just about choices and segments of people who choose to do bad things, is that there's this constellation of factors that are layered on top of each other that make it for a high probability of violence in certain communities. So what I would love to do, I mean, we're, we literally, he's been here three months, I don't want him to leave yet. Um, right, don't leave, right? Um, <laughs> is to be able to do just that. And when I say, you know, how do we measure outcomes, I think even for our assistants, we become so rote in what we do. You know, someone has a possession of a controlled substance, this is what we always offer. They go off, they do, they do their thing, they go away, and then we see them again. So our behaviors are not based on what is really happening. Are we having a real impact? We just do things because we've always done them that way. 
with the use of this data, what we want to be able to say is, what would happen if we invested more of our resources in prevention? If we keep seeing the same folks coming back, perhaps we should see what would happen with this pilot group and allow us to be more innovative in how we look on the front end of this. And I don't think you can do that with data. Like I said, it, it is crime and violence and all of that, it has such a visceral reaction for folks that we want the quickest, easiest thing to make us feel better, but we ignore tons of research that's at our fingertips and allow us to partner, for example, um, with folks in the mental health community, folks in the education community. If we are able to look at our data and see what schools are producing the most young people who come into our juvenile courts, then that means we maybe we can target more intervention practices in that area and not so many practices in an area where we don't have that many referrals. How we stack our courtrooms, where we put our human resources, um, Rolling Meadows and Skokie, um, for those of you who have not ventured outside of the city, um, our North and Northwest who have different needs than Markham, but we put the same number of attorneys in the courtrooms. And so that's what this data, we want to be able to do that, to take it beyond what you see here and connect it with other partners in research that's already done to help us think of more innovative approaches to fighting violence. When the court system comes online and up to date with case management, will you integrate the system to pull the data directly from the court system files? Who's that optimist that said that that's going to happen? <laughs> I'm going to say sure. Uh, <laughs> what do I got to lose on that? Um, are you aware that they're going to be able to get it up anytime soon? No, I, I yeah. yeah. If they do, yes, we will gladly try to figure out a way to work with them. I don't know if you saw the paper yesterday. We're still using carbon, um, carbon paper in Cook County in the courts. But if that happens, we're down for it. In those um, cases that you're tracking all the way from arraignment to, to disposition, do you get information about reversals, overturnings, anything that happens after a conviction, and is that included in the data sets? So um, we definitely, a couple things that um, happen. Um, after someone is sentenced, that sentence can be modified. And so you are, we are publishing the most recent version of the modified or the current sentence um, for that person. So. It, um, and we also have an indicator that suggests if it's um, the initial or been modified um, uh, sentence. The other piece of it is that we have no information in this uh, data set around the case. So in that case, we're not publishing any, any of those data. I've been listening to a lot of uh, I guess stories around um, kind of criminal justice and policing and other things. That I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on the data sources that they're using to tell those stories and also if you found anything surprising in compiling this data set, something that you just didn't expect seeing. Um, so I'll, I'll answer the first part, because I don't, I think, I'll answer the second part. The surprising thing was kind of the disparity between what we thought we were doing and what we were actually doing. Um, and again, because we have a case management system and a hand count system and the disparities between the hand counts and having Matthew reconcile um, what is written on well, these folders versus what's inputted into computers and how do we tell that story um, has been a real big surprise to me. Um, I think for other law enforcement partners, for example, CPD has become um, much more driven by data. Um, and you can have a conversation about algorithms and how all of that works at another time. But I think they have been, whether it's with the ComStat program or the like, have been more focused on what are we doing? How do we show our work? And so for me, I think it is interesting you know, when something happens. So for example, we saw data last week um, on WBEZ about you know, a plummet in number of marijuana arrests um, in the city of Chicago and the county. My question was, does that correlate with what's happening in our system? Um, how do we know that that's still happening? Or have our marijuana uh, prosecutions gone down? Generally, their misdemeanors and tracking them has been really hard. But when they are telling a story, you have historically not been able to check. Um, and not to say that it's automatically suspicious, but you want to be able to either compliment or refute. Um, and they've been able to do that much better than we have because we haven't had the data sets to back it up. 
Um, and so, you know, Superintendent Johnson and I meet on a fairly regular basis. He knows that Matthew is here. We are going to start sharing our data with them more regularly. One quick point um, on gun cases. Chicago has a tremendous amount of cases of guns that we get. And there was a lot of talk last year and a bill was actually passed about enhancing sentences. What we saw when we looked at some of the data, it wasn't so much that people were doing this revolving door coming in and out of the justice system and that's what was happening with guns. We saw that a number of our gun cases were falling apart before we got to trial. So when we looked at, or when they went to trial, if they didn't plead out, the results were not what we were expecting. So one big surprise was, for example, if a gun, someone who's possessing a gun, took their case to a bench trial, a trial before a judge, not a jury. Our conviction success rate was 30, 31%. So seven out of 10 people who took their case to trial on a gun case before a judge, seven out of 10 of them were being found not guilty. On a jury case, it was around 40%, 40%. So the question was, it was, these people weren't even getting to sentencing, what was happening that these cases were falling apart? And again, significant in that we have a gun violence issue, but our response was we need to be more punitive here and not really answering the question of what's happening in the beginning. So then that leads us to ask a series of questions. Are we not charging the appropriate cases? Is there more that we need to do? Is there a credibility issue that we need to address? It leads to a bunch of other things that now, Superintendent Johnson didn't know that. Like his, his response was, the system is just letting people go. So we meet on a monthly basis with those statistics to say this is what's happening in the courtroom. Because you have to remember, they arrest, they drop them off at the jail, and then they go off and make the next arrest. Most people aren't talking about what happens when they go into the courtroom and come out. And with that disconnect, Again, you, lend, you see uh, policies that aren't reflective of what's actually happening. Um, so we're trying to share our data um, as best we can with CPD and hope that they share their data with us. There's a site that Derek has, the million dollar block. block. Oh, yeah. So one of the things I was wondering about is someone goes to jail and a lot of times they are then floated all over the country, if not all over the state, and they may have gone in for a petty crime, but they come out as criminals. Do you all plan to have that as a part of your data set so that you can actually see if someone goes to Menard versus if they go to some private jail, do they kind of commit more crimes based on who they interact with and that kind of stuff? Because that might have an impact on the type of person that might come back after they get out. Yeah, so there is data that the Illinois Department of Corrections puts out that, I believe it was UIC that worked on the Million Dollar Blocks um, project, that talks about where people are housed and where they go back to. So a lot of that is based on parole data, that is data that generally we don't get. Once our case goes to sentencing, um, we are done, right? We don't, we don't go beyond sentencing. So again, the disconnect of data systems. Um, police do their part, they drop off, um, and then we do our part, we drop off, then prisons do their part and they drop off, but we're dealing with the same people. Um, what I can tell you is that the recidivism rate, the rate by which people who are released from um, incarceration, prison incarceration, and return back within three years in Illinois is hovering around 60%, six zero. And so the question is, and again, I think there's, there's been data and research that's done, that there are about seven zip codes where the majority of people who come from Chicago who are downstate in prisons come back to. And again, if we did that heat map, we know where those are. The questions that we need to start asking from a prevention standpoint, because again, I, I don't know what business model where a 60% failure rate is acceptable but we keep doing the same thing. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what do we do um, to ensure that those people who are coming out have opportunities to not engage in criminal behavior in the future? And this isn't like, every time I talk about this, people are like, oh, she's all like soft and cuddly. This, we want to bang tables. This is, a, this is for public safety's sake. 
the inability for people returning from prisons to find employment, right? If people have jobs, they tend not to engage in criminal behavior. It is, it is really that simple. It is not so much about where we're putting police cars, where we're, you know, how we're locking things up. It's really about opportunity. And for some people who we've sent to prison, for example, for drug crimes, and again, we know that drug addiction is a public health issue, right? I'm not talking about we've been sending a lot of big time drug dealers. We're talking about drug possessors who have addiction issues who don't kick it. And then they come back out and we, they are not treated and they keep cycling back in. They're not gonna be able to be healthy enough to not knock you down to take your wallet to pay, get that money to go buy some drugs. Like we know what the system looks like. Our interventions have been wedded to the way we've done things in the past. So the hope is that we work with all of these institutions, share the data that we have, and really start thinking outside of the box of how we respond to that. Because the data is there, right? Maybe we're not all talking to each other. The hope that I have by making our data public and transparent is that there's no excuse for no one else to do that. And the way that we want to make it interactive is so that we can start answering the questions ourselves if people aren't willing to do it for us.